and uh, I just want you to know that Merle should be back up here in a couple, three weeks. He's got his glasses on their way. They've been ordered, and so when he gets those back and gets used to them, then maybe we can get him back up here and do his scriptures again. I know he misses it. Anyway, the scripture for today is Mark 12:28 through 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is, is one. Love your Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second one is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are writing in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than any burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. So be it. If you notice in your bulletins, I put a little image in there that I found that said, Life in the Kingdom, What Are You Seeking First? And that song that Jacob and Sherry did last, that's one of my favorite songs because I just think about, you know, what really does matter to you? If everything else was stripped away, would you trust in God? But even more, would you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul and all your strength. If you don't understand that, then you don't understand what Jesus was teaching. You don't understand how much God loves you that He would come, that He would come in human form, that He would send His only Son to die for your sins. If you didn't see the movie Friday night, boy, it made me think about that. It was a little violent and stuff. But when your world is turned upside down and everything that you were, had your security tied up into and your loved ones were gone, would you still trust in Him? Would you still walk by faith? And would you be able to forgive the people that actually stripped those things from you? That was some of the themes in the movie and it really got me thinking. As you've been reading this week, you should have read some more of Mark. And in this upcoming week, you'll start in Acts. If you don't have a devotional book, be sure to get one. I've got more besides these two. So be sure you're reading your devotion along beside your Bible reading and spend time in prayer and studying so that you can come to know just how much God loves you for what Jesus Christ did for you. And we're going to get into some of that scripture today that we covered this week. But let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you that you do love us so much. You show us what love is like, that unconditionally you loved us even when we were your enemies, when we spit upon your son's face and drove the nails into his hands and feet. He was silent. He went willingly to the cross so that he could die for our sins so that we could be made right with you. Lord, we just thank you and praise you. Let Jesus be all that matters in our lives. Empower us with your spirit, Lord. Turn us into that new creation that Scripture tells us about. Let us die to our sinful nature and be the new creation in Christ to live and bring glory and honor to you. Open our eyes that we may see and our ears that we may hear and understand. And may we apply it to to our lives through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what does the kingdom of God look like? Well, you've got to open your eyes first, don't you? Then you've got to listen. And yet still, if you've been reading your scripture, you'll see that not even Peter comprehended. Even after he said, when Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? And he said, You are the Messiah. And if you read along the same story in John, 
You'll know that Jesus even said, are you going to forsake me now? Because the teachings that Jesus started teaching were tough teachings. Let's be honest. They're tough teachings. But see, Jesus called us to be something totally, radically different. And again, that movie got me thinking about that. What would I do faced with those things? And I don't know that I would have that kind of faith. So the first thing I want to do, like from your reading, is increase my faith, Lord. Because I want to be empowered by the Spirit to trust only in God. Which just makes sense. Because if He created me, if He loves me, if He sent His Son to die for me, He cares for me. Why would I want to put my hope and trust in anything else? But so many times we do. So I pray that He opens my eyes that I may see and opens my ears that I may hear and understand. Not this physical world, but the spiritual world, which is eternal. And that's what Jesus is teaching them in where we read in Mark this week. The mighty miracles that He did, the feeding of the people, weren't for the physical needs. Yes, Jesus cured and healed and supplied their physical needs. But it was so that they would see their spiritual need for a Savior. To see and to hear spiritual truth. So last week in Mark 8, I told you there was kind of a transitional period there where Jesus, where Mark writes through Peter's eyes who Jesus is, but then he starts writing through Peter's eyes the realization of who Jesus is and the teachings that he teaches. Because see, Peter again thought that Jesus came to save him, to fill his needs and desires. Not that he would have to give up all of his needs and desires, to fall at Jesus' feet so that Jesus would be all that matters, so that he could walk in the footsteps of Jesus, which meant denying himself, taking up his cross, and following after Jesus. In Mark 8, starting in verse 14 to 21, there is a warning here given for us to see and hear. Yet so many people didn't understand this. They came to get their bellies filled. They came to have their problems fixed. They didn't come to Jesus because God had sent someone to save them from their sins. In verse 14 it says, The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them on the boat. So Jesus warned them, Be careful. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. See, they're so far from spiritual truth. All their thinking is what they can physically see and their physical needs. They don't hear Jesus' words. They say, we don't have bread to fill our tummies. What are we going to do? I think there are a lot more serious problems in life than that. And let's be honest, you're not even in control of feeding yourself. Get a disease that stricken you or whatever and someone else has to feed or bathe you or whatever it takes for you to realize that. Get your freedoms taken away from you. Will you trust in God to supply your needs? Will you trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross? Verse 17, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not understand? If not, Jesus' next words are why. It's because your hearts are hardened. And he asked them that. Are your hearts hardened? I can't imagine what the disciples were thinking at that time, but I can think through my eyes and everything. What do you mean? I've given up everything to follow you. I've seen your miracles. What do you mean my heart is hardened? Surely he's not talking about me, but there's no one else here at this point. But his closest followers who have given up everything. Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see, and ears but fail to hear? These questions are given to those who have given up everything to follow Jesus. You've seen the miracles, you've seen the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000, and yet you don't get it. You think it's about your physical needs. When you need to change your way of thinking, repent, for the kingdom of God has come. It is at hand. You need to be thinking from an upside-down thought view that you've ever had before. 
that you don't walk by sight, but you walk by faith. And then Jesus goes on saying, Don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, Seven. He said to them, Do you still not understand? Now maybe you haven't read that and understood that. Maybe it jumped off the, off the Bible, off the letters this time to you. Jesus is not talking about physical bread. He's not talking about physical nourishment. And what was left over that could feed them again for however long? He's not talking about that. He's talking about when you rely on Him for your spiritual bread, you will have tons left over. So that when those things are stripped from you and you don't have anywhere else to turn from you, to turn to, you will have Jesus because you will have such a spiritual overload of bread to supply your needs. So when times are tough, and the movie showed that, boy did it show that, that they could walk by faith and they could even forgive someone that would murder their parents. Could you do that? If you're feeding on spiritual bread, yes, you can. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You can walk whatever this earth has to give to you. Whatever it dishes out. Because the things in this world mean nothing compared to eternity. And when Jesus died on the cross, He paved your way to eternity if you will just believe in Him. In Mark chapter 1, Mark recorded about Jesus Jesus' public ministry. When the Spirit came upon him and God said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased, the very next thing that happened is the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted so that he could face every temptation that you would ever face. He faced it personally with the devil. He just didn't have one sitting here on his shoulder saying, Do this. You know, like you see in the cartoons and stuff, and a little angel over here. He was tempted by Satan. He was in a state of need and want when Satan came to him. Need for physical nourishment, physical bread. And Satan came to him. Now we don't have this in in Mark, but we can go to Matthew and see it. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. That's an understatement. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, prove this to me, tell these stones to become bread. Satan again was talking about the physical, but Jesus himself relied on the power of the Spirit, the power of God living through him. And Jesus' answer was this, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So now that brings me full circle back around. Are you reading the Word of God? Are you spending time in prayer, seeking God's will? Are you looking to your own will and desires? Are you looking to His will and His desires? Do you want your kingdom come or His kingdom come? Jesus is getting very clear. His teachings are getting very hard. If you want to be my disciple, it means giving up everything you thought you knew. It means pain and suffering. It means ridicule. But it also means eternal rewards in heaven that no one can take that away from you if you'll follow in Jesus' footsteps. The first thing the devil used against Jesus was his physical need for physical bread. And see, sometimes that's all Satan has to do with us to get us caught, to get us in a snare that holds us and traps us. What about this? What about that? How am I going to feed myself? I'll do this for you, Lord, once I get my bills paid, once my kids are through school, whatever it is. I'll serve you then, I promise. But as I told you before, Mark says that we're supposed to respond immediately to the gospel. We're not supposed to worry about these physical things which we can't control in the first place. Won't God take care of your physical needs if He would send His Son to die for your spiritual needs? I mean, 
there's no comparison. <clears throat> Jesus' answer let Satan know that he was looking at the spiritual, not the physical. Jesus even said in Scripture that the Son of Man had no place to lay his head when he's telling his disciples, do you really want to follow me? He put his faith and trust in God alone. You think Jesus was trying to tell us something then when we apply that verse to when he fed the 5,000 and the 4,000 and there was leftover bread? Is he trying to tell us that if we rely on spiritual bread that we will have an abundance? I think that's what he's trying to tell us. I think that's what he's trying to tell the disciples here. And even Peter didn't get it at this point. In John, we can learn a little bit more about that feeding of the 5,000. In John 6, verse 26, after Jesus fed the 5,000, he said, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. These miracles were done so that you would see that He is the Son of God, that He can forgive sins. Remember when He told the man to take up his mat and walk? He said, what is harder, to say that I forgive sins or to say, take up your mat and walk? Well, let me show you that I can forgive sins. Take up your mat and walk. He showed them with the physical healings again that he could heal spiritually, that he had the power to give eternal life to those that believed in him. Verse 27 says, Do not work for food that spoils, for physical things, but for food that endures, endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on Him God the Father has placed His seal of approval. So if you don't believe the miracles and everything else, believe the audible voice that came from heaven that said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased, which we have several times in Scripture, so that people actually heard God's voice. But it's funny that, you know, in... Not funny, but it's funny. In John 12, when some people thought it was thunder, because we want to explain it that way. I don't know how you could take, this is my son, and say that sounded like thunder, but I guess if you don't want to hear it, you'd think anything. You know, do you remember when you laid on the grass in the summertime and looked at the clouds and saw all these things, how you saw that? You said you could see it. I was lying. I just didn't see what you saw. See, there's the difference because we want to see through our own perspective again. Thank you for that sermon illustration. We want to see what we see because we want our needs met. We don't want to suffer. Who would? Jesus. He suffered and died for you and I. Wow. What man, what greater thing, love than a man has than to lay down his life for his friend? That's exactly what Jesus did and exactly what Jesus calls us to do. So in the end of Mark 8, we get these words recorded from Mark. And I want to say them again. I said them last week, and I'll say them again and again as I preach. Verse 34, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, This is to all of those who want to know about Jesus at all. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It's not a should, or would, or could. It's a must. You must be willing to give up everything for Jesus. Like the song says, when nothing else matters, that's when you're in that holy place. When you just want to sit at Jesus' feet and worship, then you're understanding who Jesus is and what He came to do, what He taught. Verse 35, For whoever wants to save their life, they will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good does it do someone to gain the whole world, all the physical things, but forfeit their soul, the spiritual things? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? No one can obtain heaven. None are righteous. No, not one. That's why God loved us so much that He sent His Son to do what we cannot do. And even when we don't have faith, as the man says, which we'll get to, he says, increase my faith. 
If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes with His Father's glory and the holy angels. When Jesus comes again at His second advent, He will come and He will separate the sheep from the goats. Don't let these verses go in one ear and out the other. Because that day they went in and out of the ears of most everyone there, including Peter. He didn't understand at this point. How could he understand at this point? The Holy Spirit hadn't been given to him yet. If you believe you are a new creation in Christ, you have been born again by the very Spirit of God. The same Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness, the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. You are called to be the hands and feet of Christ to do greater things than He did, to be tied together spiritually by the Spirit to do the works of Christ in His body called the church. So what did Mark write about next? Well, in chapter 9, when we start our reading this week, we see the transformation of Jesus. You see again that Peter has no idea what's going on, why it's going on, what to say about it. But think about what he saw. I can't even imagine. But he got a glimpse of what his future hope looked like. Jesus in his glory, which if he believed in the resurrection of the dead, if that's where your hope is, then he saw a glimpse of his eternal future transformed into this glorious creation. He saw Moses and Elijah, so he saw real men that existed, and he saw them in this condition. I don't know, I can't comprehend what he thought. He didn't know what he thought. But he got to see this glimpse that should forever change his thought, change his way of life. And still he had no idea what to say. And I'm not here to slam Peter. It's refreshing to know that Peter had walked with God, for God incarnate, Jesus, for two years, and he still didn't have any comprehension. <sighs> At least that gives me some hope some days, right? That's why it's refreshing to me. Because I realize that I fight that spiritual battle. And Peter, even walking with Jesus, I see his struggles fighting this spiritual battle. One of the biggest purposes that Peter, James, and John got to see this is they got to see the hope of our resurrection also. Something that Jesus promised He could do by the miracles that He did. That He had the power to forgive sins and offer eternal life. So in Mark 9, if you keep reading, in verse 9, as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had done until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So you see this continued theme about not telling who Jesus is because they're still not going to get it fully until they see the resurrected Jesus. Verse 10, they kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. What a glorious sight they had seen, but they didn't have the comprehension to understand it. So they come down off this mountaintop high. Have you ever been there before? To a valley low, right? Because what do they find as soon as they get down? Well, all we've got to do is keep reading. Verse 14, when they came down to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. Now just think about that statement right there. The other disciples, the ones that were on equal ground with them, but maybe they thought they were a little better than them because they got to see the transformation and they didn't. But still, this is one, these are the twelve. And there's also the other disciples, the others who are following after Jesus, not just the twelve a large crowd who's trying to figure out who Jesus is, and then those who say they're religious, but yet are so far from Jesus they have no understanding of what the Scripture really means. And they're arguing with one another. There's discord, lack of unity, not being able to focus on the mission that they've been called to do because they're concerned with physical things. They're concerned with having their tummies full. Verse 15, as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, Jesus asked. 
A man in the crowd said, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation is Jesus' answer. Now, who's that answer to again? That's why I told you in the beginning. To the other disciples, the other nine. The other 70, 100, 500 that were there that said they would follow Jesus, whatever the number was, to the crowds that were wondering, to the people who said they were religious, but their words were void of any meaning, right? And to a man who came in faith to the, let's call that the church then. Ooh, how do you like when I turn it that way? A man that came in faith, wondering who Jesus was, hearing of the mighty miracles he, that he did, bringing his son, who is in such a physical condition here that all of us are sitting here saying, wow, that child is suffering. And I don't like my children suffering. And this man brought his son to the church in faith, and the church couldn't do anything because they were arguing with one another and had no faith to heal him. Now the man wouldn't have brought his son if he didn't have hope that he could heal him. Because the scripture would have read differently. It would have said, I brought my son to you, Jesus, but then I left because you weren't here. No, he stayed because he expected the disciples to be able to take care of the matter. The ones who truly had faith, even if the Pharisees couldn't take care of it, even if the others couldn't, at least these nine should be able to take care of it. So this statement from Jesus, you unbelieving generation, hits the most home to the ones who say they believe the most, does it not? You unbelieving generation, you claim to follow me, but you have no faith. And just think about how Peter, James, and John were. They were on a spiritual mountaintop high, and now they've been brought to the valley low because their comrades in arms, we'll call them that, couldn't take care of this matter. Maybe they thought they could if they would have been there. Or maybe they realized themselves their lack of faith when Jesus said this. Maybe those words hit home to them as well. Because it should hit home to us. Because so many times we lack the faith to see the mighty miracles. Scripture tells us that one of the saddest things is the fact that Jesus walked away from towns and did not perform the miracles that He could have performed there because of their lack of faith. He didn't choose not to do them. He didn't do them because we didn't have the faith to see the miracles done in the first place because God works through a prayerful, faithful, obedient people. If you don't see that, go back to the Old Testament and read some more. He had hand-trained these men to be his hands and feet. He had told them that he was going to die. They were to carry on his mission. That's why they followed him as their rabbi, their teacher. And yet when Jesus came down off the mountain and had shown his glory to Peter, James, and John, he found this unbelieving generation. And nothing's changed, guys. We just need to walk by faith, not by sight. Well, one thing has changed. The Spirit is here. But we've got to rely on that. And you see that change, and we're going to get into Acts here just this week. You'll see how the Spirit of God changed Peter and James and John and Barnabas and Paul and all of these people. And you see that they didn't care anything for their own life, but considered it all rubbish and garbage to knowing Christ, to bringing glory and honor to God. But instead, Jesus found unbelief, discord. He saw someone who still needed training, and yet he was going to the cross shortly. <clears throat> Before we read on, think about, because that's why I called it the church, how disappointed, how hurt Jesus was with his church. Because they didn't heal the man's son because they didn't believe how many times has Jesus called us to do something and because we lacked faith we didn't see a mighty miracle done 
Now, I'm not saying that to tear you down. I'm saying that to lead you to the cross so that you realize the mighty things that He wants to have done through His children, through His disciples, through Christians. Because of their lack of faith, the disciples failed. No other reason. Mark 9, verse 19 through 23, You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long will Jesus have to physically train them? How many miracles will He have to do? But that's not frustrating enough. Look at Jesus' next words. How long shall I put up with you? Put up with this condition, this childish behavior, this lack of faith, this saying you believe one thing and not, this hearing constantly but not perceiving, this seeing with your own eyes but not understanding, still relying on physical rather than relying on spiritual. Bring the boy to me. So they brought him to Jesus. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell on the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Now, I don't know why these words are here again, but I, they struck out to me to show the anguish again that this boy was in and this father was in that the church could have healed if they would have had faith. Verse 21, So Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has, has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. What a terrible situation. And the church was called to help it, but they didn't because of their lack of faith. How disappointed Jesus must have been. How frustrated he must have been. Simply because we didn't have faith that could say to the mountain, jump up and go into the sea. Because that's what his word says that we'll be able to do. And join together how many greater works will we do than what Jesus did alone. Because all the different gifts the Spirit gives us because of the different places we can be at one time when there was only one Jesus that could come down off the mountain and heal him, but there wasn't. There was a bunch of like Jesus's little Christ, Christians, that could have done something if they had faith. If they were willing to trust in God to do it. So I think that's why Jesus said those words about how long has he been like this? So that the man wouldn't lose hope. Because the man, the father, was dashed because of the lack of faith of those who proclaimed Christ. He had come in faith and had his faith bashed upon the rocks because they didn't build their foundation firmly on Jesus Christ. They didn't think they could do anything to help. They argued with one another, whatever the reasons are. So Jesus is saying to the man, it doesn't matter how long you've been in this condition, your son's been in this condition. Yes, I can help. So the man says to him, if you can do anything, because see, he's lost faith because those that followed Christ couldn't do anything. Can Christ really do anything? Yeah, you better believe he can. So he says, take pity on us and help us. Because the father is in just as much turmoil because of the turmoil that his son's in. Jesus' answer in verse 23 is, If you can, Jesus said. And look at his answer. It doesn't say, I can do this. God can do this. What does it say? Everything is possible for one who believes. Now that statement is directed at the man, of course, that brought his son. But again, it's so much more directed at those who say they belong to Christ, but yet don't have the power of faith to believe it and do mighty works in His name. You're a new creation in Christ. The old things are gone. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus wouldn't be teaching these things to His followers if He didn't expect them to do it. If He didn't give them the power to do it. If you will just believe. What was the Father's response? Verse 24, immediately, 
<laughs> no hesitation. The boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I don't know about you, but that should be a verse you remember. You should write down right now and you should pray all the time. Whenever you have doubts, you may not be able to do anything about them, but you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Jesus did everything on the cross. He brought you to saving faith. He'll walk you all the way through this life. He'll sanctify you and make you holy for all eternity. Just believe. Mark goes on to record, Jesus then tells him the second time about his death so that they'll understand the spiritual behind it, not just the physical. But yet they still argued about who was going to be the greatest. And I find this just amazing. Jesus doesn't reprimand them. He just tells them, if you want to be greatest, then forget all this worldly stuff and work for the kingdom. Work for things that are spiritual. Let me tell you how to be greatest. Not here, but there. Be a servant of all. Give up your life. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow after me. I don't know if you know it or not, but there's no half disciple. There's no half Christian. Either you're following Jesus or you're not. Either you're like Christ are, or you are not. Lord, please help me with my unbelief so that I can bring glory and honor to God, so that I can live the life that Jesus Christ died for me to live. In Mark 9, Jesus goes on to say, For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. If just giving a cup of water out of love gets you a reward in heaven, think about the rewards you're building up that if you walk by faith and can do a mighty miracle in His name. That you can gather people for eternity rather than scattering people for eternity because you have faith. <clears throat> in chapter 9, Mark begins recording the teachings of Jesus so that we'll really know why Jesus came in the gospel that He taught. Christianity is free, but it's not cheap. It'll cost you everything. If it doesn't cost you everything, if it doesn't mean everything like the song says, then it might not have any value to you at all. And Jesus warns and warns and warns about this in His teachings. The closing words of Mark chapter 9 are these, starting in verse 42. If anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. Who are these words written to again? I think they were written most to the nine disciples, especially who didn't believe. They're everyone else too, but the ones who said they truly believed more was accounted to them. They were more responsible. Verse 43, If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Not mutilation. What do your hands do? Your hands are what you do things with. If you can't do spiritual things for the kingdom, then it would be better for you to cut them off and enter into life without that hand. Okay? If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed with two, than with two hands and go into hell where the fire never goes out. If you've got the NIV, you'll notice 44 is missing. I'll go back to it in a second. Verse 45, if your foot causes you to stumble, because that's where you go. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and to be thrown in hell. If you've got NIV, verse 46 is missing. And if your eye causes you to stumble, because that's what you see and have the lust, and that's where you walk by sight, not by faith, but by spiritual sight, okay? If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out, because it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Verse 48, Where the worms that eat them do not die, 
and the fire is not quenched. Now those two verses that are missing are those two identical verses that are in some transcripts. If they're there in the original uh, script, that's three times the same verse was repeated. If they're not, you got it once. Either way, you've got it. Where the worm that eats the flesh in the fires of your decaying body never dies. That was a physical example that the people knew about at that time where their enemies and stuff were thrown out in the garbage dump and the worms ate their flesh and there was a fire that smoldered and you smelt the burning flesh. And Jesus is using this as a physical example that they knew about to tell you about a spiritual truth that you don't want to go to hell, that you want to have saving faith, that you want to put your faith and trust in Jesus and His finished work on the cross, not on things. And if you do, if you do, this is what's so great, you will build up rewards. You will be the greatest. You don't have to worry about who's going to be the greatest. You will be if you give up your life. You'll save yourselves from the fire of hell and you will be great in the kingdom of heaven. This is what the kingdom looks like. But boy, don't cause anyone to stumble. Who caused the Father to stumble that day? The ones who said they had the most faith and did nothing. Verse 49, everyone will be salted with fire. If you remember reading back in the Old Testament, you'll remember about them salting their offerings that came, their grain offerings and such. That salt was something they did to show that it was being purified. So you will be purified through fire, through something that causes you pain. There are scriptures that tells us about the refining fire. So be sure that you realize that and you undergo those things with the joy that Jesus gave you. The same joy that He counted the cross as something worthy, something that He should do because of what glory and honor it would bring Him and what it would do for you in bringing you salvation. Verse 50, salt is good, so salt that you're offering, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. So he directly goes back to their, that first verse talking about they were arguing with one another. There was no peace and harmony in the church, let alone there was no faith in the church. That meant the church was dead. The whole reason that Jesus was going to the cross here shortly and die the church had no idea about. And they caused a father to stumble and a boy to continue to suffer because they lacked faith. Jesus' teachings are tough. That's why I said that. And He doesn't back off with His teachings. In Mark 12, verse 33, it reads, To love Him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself, this is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. That's what Polly read us this morning. That was what the religious leader gave back as an answer to Jesus. He realized Jesus' words rang with truth. But would they penetrate His ears to where they really changed His mind and changed His heart? Would he see with his own eyes the miracles that Jesus did to change his heart? I don't know the answer to that. But I know at this point he had come to Jesus to test him. And he said, good answer, teacher. Well, look at what Jesus' answer back to him was in verse 34. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. This man had a glimpse of what the kingdom of God looked like but would he enter it? Would he live it here on earth? That's my question for you today. If you read your Bible and, and it goes in one ear and out the other, what good is it? If you don't have unity with your fellow brothers and sisters, what good is it? If you use the things that you say to tear down instead of building up, what good is it? If you love some but don't love others, what good is it? If you don't have the faith to move mountains, you should. 
Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for what you've done through Christ. We praise you for his teachings. May we comprehend them and apply them to our lives and live for spiritual truths rather than just worrying about our physical. May we get to the point where nothing else matters but sitting at Jesus' feet and worshiping Him and being a light to this world. May we have faith that saves our children and may others not distract us, but may we live in harmony with one another where we build up one another, where we bring glory and honor to You and build up treasures in heaven. Lord, help us to be kingdom people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.